Thank you, Team PSG, Rutul, Dr. Banshi, Damendra, all for having us here. Um, it's great learning for me as well, being in the hall, learning a bit more nuances about uh, hip, as we would like to call it now. So I'm going to be speaking on specifically on, on CGM and pumps, the role of CGM in pregnancy with diabetes. This was our recommendation when we published the first CGM consensus in, in 2019 that CGM during pregnancy can be used as a teaching tool to evaluate the glucose patterns and fine-tune the insulin dose. CGM in pregnancy can supplement blood glucose monitoring um, for nocturning different aspects, whether it's nocturnal hypo or hyperglycemia or postprandial excursions. Now, this is the standard guidelines for TIR, those who are familiar with the, the TIR metric, but this is the further aspect to it which has been added. So when, it, when you go back and see here in the international guidelines when it comes to type 1 pregnancy, there are clear TIR guidelines. When it comes to GDM and type 2 diabetes, uh, it's still said that we need more information and data. And this is the 2019 paper by Batalino and others which speaks that even in gestational diabetes or type 2 diabetes and pregnancy, we're talking about having 90% and up TIR between 63 to 140 with less than 5% above 140 and of course as less hypoglycemia which is 63 in pregnancy and not 70. So CGM effects on maternal glycemic control and pregnancy outcome in patients with GDM. This is a prospective cohort study which included 340 women uh, with GDM who had 4 weeks of blinded CGM plus standard care or just standard care alone. So this is a time of professional CGM which was used more than. What they found in terms of pregnancy outcomes is subjects in the CGM group versus routine care group were at lower risk of preeclampsia and primary cesarean delivery. Let me halt here to welcome Professor Shesha in the room. Everybody has been speaking about these things. Right. Yes. So we're talking about the study which compared professional CGM versus standard of care um, and seeing about lower risk of preeclampsia and primary cesarean delivery just purely by the virtue of doing CGM. You also look at some neonatal outcomes and subjects in the CGM group versus the routine care group had lesser frequency of macrosomia or LGA neonates in the group where you had more closer monitoring through CGM. So the use of supplementary CGM combined with routine antenatal care can actually improve glycemic control and pregnancy outcome of patients with GDM. You're looking at a study specific to the freestyle Libre flash glucose monitoring and all of you are aware that we have this available now with the app as well. And I'll be speaking a little more on the nuances of the app as we move ahead. So 74 participants with type 1 diabetes and, and uh, which had 24 of type 1 and, and 11 of type 2 and 39 gestational diabetes individuals. Sensor glucose values were compared with capillary SMBG values where patients did SMBG at least 4 times a day. So this is real time CGM versus SMBG. The clinical accuracy of sensor results versus SMBG was about 88%. And 99.8% within the zones A and zones A and B. So those who understand the grid zones for comparing any monitoring device, largely telling us about the accuracy of CGM even in pregnancy as compared to SMBG. Sensor accuracy was unaffected by the type of diabetes or the stage of pregnancy, whether insulin was used, individual's age or BMI. The user questionnaire indicated high level of satisfaction with sensor wear the overall system use and comparison to SMBG and there were no unanticipated device related adverse events. So this has been an interesting study which is bringing home the importance and accuracy and acceptance of real-time CGM in pregnancy. This is freestyle Libre system improves glucose control and clinical outcomes in type 1 pregnant women. The accuracy of freestyle Libre in pregnant women um, in type 1 individuals reported in 24 cases over 2 weeks. So freestyle library was assessed over a 
long time during pregnancy and they found strong positive correlation between interstitial capillary glucose uh, levels reported throughout the analysis period. Freestyle Libre sensors provide information about glucose trend at each scan, a better accuracy of the device during the third trimester in comparison with the second trimester was reported. We don't know the reasons for the same, whether it is related to interstitial glucose volume etc that they are talking about, but there were some changes between the second and third in terms of the accuracy reported. Now let me bring home the entire concept of freestyle CGM. So this is an integrated freestyle Libre platform of digital health solutions for more personalized care. You have three different components of this software. What the patient downloads and uses is called the freestyle Libre link. This is the Abbott CGM product I am talking about. What the patient can share with a family member or uh, any other person that he wants to share the information with is the Libre link up uh, aspect of the software and what you as the treating physician or doctor or gynac if interested in, in monitoring can have in your clinic is the Libre view system. So they have three components, freestyle Libre link which the patient has, freestyle Libre link up and the Libre view with the patient has. How many of you are using this software? Excellent. How many Libre link ups can the patient have? Sorry? Yeah, you are right. And you are giving the answer, you are right. So, don't be yeah. it, it's up. It is up to 20 that you can have link ups. So, somewhere I do not know why the word link up came in, but it is interesting in the larger scheme of things. The components of the freestyle Libre system work together to offer easily shared glucose data. So, again, as I said, for patients, what they have is the link. Uh, Libre link app for any other family member that they want to share the data with. It's it's link up and your clinician's view is the Libre view which we start seeing in our clinics almost continuously. A comparative study which spoke about use of freestyle Libre link app associated with better glycemic management in comparison to freestyle Libre readers. What does this mean? Ideally, Wherever the freestyle Libre came in, it was supposed to come in with the software. That's what happened in the rest of the world. In India, unfortunately, the software was not approved and caught up in regulatory approvals. So we had the freestyle CGM, but the patients had to keep using their readers and scan with the readers and see the data only on the reader. There was no official availability of the software for them to download the data, to share the data, to look at the analytics. So there is this comparative study where somebody who is using the reader as compared to using the app and they found that the time and range was better when the individual used the link app 65.3% as compared to 60% and those using readers time above was lesser when you use the app 31% as compared to 36 and, and the average glucose values were lower in those who use the app as compared to the reader. What is the flow? This is the flow of using real-time CGM. The patient applies the sensor. The sensor will capture the patient's interstitial glucose readings, transfer the data to the app continuously or can be seen on the reader as well by scanning. But honestly, in today's times, uh, if you're using the, the app on the phone, you need not have the reader or carry extra device. Why have that extra device onto your person? The same data from here can be seen by the physician in their clinics and the Libre view or on your laptop wherever on the Libre view system and, and the entire data can be analyzed by the physician and you can guide the patient. So today your patients of pregnancy and diabetes who are doing closer monitoring through CGM need not keep visiting a diabetologist or an endocrinologist or a physician's office for glucose control. They may still land up seeing their obstetricians for other work. In terms of glucose control, everything can be remote. Every couple of days, every day, depending on how the patient needs it, you sitting in your office can view what is happening every hour or every few hours to your patient's glucose and handhold them and guide them. And this is transforming the tighter control that we've been talking about and this is the beauty of real-time CGM. Well, it's intended for use by patients and healthcare professionals to assist people with diabetes and their healthcare professionals in the review, analysis and evaluation of the data. 
It's important we understand limitations of technology as much as one may want to believe there are always limitations of every technology. So LibreView is a secondary viewer and not intended to provide treatment decisions or be used as a substitute for healthcare advice. And these are the aspects today you and me will have to talk to our patients whether they are pregnant or not when you start using freestyle CGM about how not to overreact to the readings how there are limitations to the sensor readings at times and how not to make immediate treatment decisions based on one high reading or a mismatch between what the patient is feeling and what the sensor glucose reading is coming up. Why LibreView? Well, as I said, LibreView is, is an excellent tool for a physician who can see every aspect of patient's sugar movement and variability um, and, and look at what's happening at different times of the day, different days, the impact of different food and different activity. And of course, the whole data can be shared amongst the team members as well. So glucose monitoring in pregnant women with diabetes, the recommendations for CGM devices, they measure glucose concentrations in the interstitial fluid. They identify glycemic excursions that may go undetected with SMBG as good as your patient may be doing 4.7.9.9. Yet, it can't compare to the number of values your CGM can pick up. And a great educational tool to improve treatment adherence. We've had some conversations since morning about, uh, since afternoon rather about, uh, you know, in the beginning, we may still want to talk about lifestyle modification, not rush in the first two weeks, uh, unless absolutely necessary with insulin or metformin. But in that time period, when your patient starts using a real-time CGM, there's a huge impact that the real-time CGM can make in patients who are very early uh, uh, hyperglycemic in their pregnancy. Just by modifying their diet, pushing their walk, exercise, what's possible. As they see the impact of that, they, this is going to be far more than any SMBG in the past. So when you speak about lifestyle change, CGM is actually motivating your patients in that phase to do that. The caveat and limitation I would always say when you start using this it requires specialized knowledge and patient education and I think that's a big challenge for all of us who are using this. Patients are picking up these tools and devices directly from, from the market from Amazon and then start overreacting or, or you know scanning excessively and not knowing what to do with the data and getting completely anxious about it. So we have to be trained first to make sure that we are training our patients. Data again showing reduced risk of macrosomia when you're using CGM, whether it's pregnant women with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, um, and even comparing different weeks of gestation, macrosomia is lesser because you're controlling the sugars better purely by the virtue of CGM. Um, I think Dr. Fatak also showed the St. Vincent's declaration, achieving pregnancy outcome in the diabetic woman that approximate that of the non-diabetic woman. I, I, Clearly, we haven't achieved that, right? Now, I don't know if a time will come and I would like to have uh, Bansi's and Dr. Sheshaya's attention to this statement. Just the other day, I was hearing about uh, what Professor uh, Vishwanathan used to say and, and I think uh, Dr. Vijay Vishwanathan was sharing that uh, as an early student, um, their father would tell them, Professor Vishwanathan would tell them that in my view, a person with diabetes actually can have better health than a non-diabetic individual because this person with diabetes knows that there is something wrong and he or she will take care of their health and screen and do other aspects and can actually lead a healthier life than somebody who is not aware of what disease is underlying. And I am beginning to think today that whether hyperglycemia and pregnancy can be actually that window of opportunity to start making changes that the outcome for a pregnancy with diabetes today can actually be better. Right? Today we are talking about it's not matching up, but actually it's, it can be better than the pregnancy outcomes in a non-diabetic individual. So that's a dream for us to see that if, if somebody knows that there is something wrong, they are going to take far more care in the future. We are comparing outcome statistics here, looking at LG and macrosomia, all this data essentially showing uh, um, the pregnancy outcomes over time, how they have changed from the early 60s to 2014. Characteristics for LGA pregnancies and we are highlighting about the impact of different HbA1c uh, in each trimester when you compare LGA to non-LGA 
uh, uh, pregnancies but this has been the the data for your a1c aspects though we had some interesting discussion today about hb1c not to be used as a uh, diagnostic tool in pregnancy you will still have data about the prognostic and the monitoring aspect of a1c even in pregnancy uh, but probably though we argue about a1c not being the best tool maybe tir and cgm today uh, will turn out to be a far more uh, appropriate tool if we leave out the the affordability aspect which we get in our discussions flamingo an interesting small study randomized control trial for fgm in gestational diabetes interventional 100 participants randomized crossover assignment um, supportive care this was in poland Randomized control trial uh, in the department of OBGY. 100 women at 24 to 28 weeks gestation was recruited. Women with GDM will individually be randomized into two groups. 50 uh, who got flash glucose monitoring and 50 who were given standard SMBG. The study group will use Libre app on their mobile phones to measure and collect the results. The control group will be instructed on SMBG use. All participants will measure their fasting and one hour postprandial concentrations daily with a weekly midnight measurement dietary recommendations similar risk bands to be given to look at physical activity dietary habits will be assessed using eating assessment test and so on the maternal and neonatal outcomes will be retrieved from medical records during the follow-up visit after delivery sorry so the main points uh, in this data were the, uh, the flash glucose monitoring improved glycemic control in gdm particularly in the third and fourth week of the study so this was between 24 and 28 weeks it reduced the incidence of fetal macrosomia in GDM patients. No significant difference in the birth while percentile in both the groups. FGM increased the detection rate of hypoglycemia but did not significantly impact the incidence of neonatal hypoglycemia. So that was one negative aspect uh, seen here. No difference though. And women in the FGM group were more likely to make diet modifications after GDM diagnosis. But this did not significantly affect the other outcomes. So though they made changes, it did not affect the outcomes. Finally, quickly, let me just show one single case report uh, of, of uh, CGM use. This is 31-year-old primary, uh, two miscarriages in the past, one and a half years back, both in the first trimester. So we know that this is precious pregnancy, no history of diabetes in the past. Preconception fasting sugars 80, postprandial 134, A1C of 5%. And this is probably why Dr. Sunil Gupta was still saying that don't look at the A1C at 5, which may be low. Uh, both parents um, were patients with diabetes on medications. Patient was asked by her gynecologist to stop sweets because they saw the postprandial at 134 and start walking. Referred to the diabetes clinic for further advice. Patient was counseled on MNT and physical activity, asked to do SMBG and return in three days' time. Um, fastings were between 80 to 95, two hours post breakfast, 110 to 120, two hours post lunch, 100 to 124. 2 hours post dinner 100 to 118 um, everything that we would say would be on the borderline range sonography at 28 weeks was normal this was precious pregnancy needed more intensive control so the physician here decided that besides smbg let me put the patient onto a cgm and see what is happening in the course of the pregnancy so how could cgm really prove to be beneficial so you're looking at um, the data for week one cgm reading started showing some glycemic variability and i'll show that Morning and post lunch spikes were started getting picked up, especially at the one hour aspect, few nocturnal dips. Patient was then given a split meal strategy along with five small frequent meals. So based on what you saw on the CGM, patient here was advised for, um, you know, uh, and given reason to, to scatter the meals, encouraged to walk comfortably if possible post meals, which will again help in, in preventing the postprandial spikes. The week two CGM reading as a result, showed marked improvements so at the end of week one seeing that your patient was advised and by in the second week itself which is economizing on the cost of the cgm you started seeing the benefits there so from week one to week two a marked improvement in tir and reductions in both the time above range and time below range was was noted and these were the aspects and this is the the part when this was done the app was not there to, for us to have the analytics so it's actually image of the reader that the patient would share um, in the first, in the first uh, uh, week, you had 80% in target. Now, some of you may ask, what's wrong with 80%? But I did show you the, the, the more recent recommendations by Batalino and others group that when it comes to 
GDM and type 2 pregnancy, we're trying to say it should be more than 90% within the range. And, and that's what we should be aiming for, for better outcomes. And you start seeing the benefit of just by splitting the meals and the patient starting to walk, getting reason to do the same. Let's understand that very often when you're dealing with even pregnant women, you may want them to change, but they need more reason and, and uh, a clear cut aspect of why to change. And CGM clearly starts providing them that reason when they visibly see the spike and the reduction of the spike once they improve their meal pattern and their walk time. So here we can see in the second week itself, the in target has changed to 92% which is super and that's what we want to do. It also improved the hypoglycemic metrics, though I would say this was not genuine hypoglycemia because what the meter is picking up as hypo or red zone is every value below 70. Right, because it could not be corrected. Even now in the system, you cannot change it to 63. We're saying the recommendation is 63, but the system still globally is not allowing because the recommendations came into being some time back. The software will have to change globally. So that's why this is a little false hypo also, but yet that false hypo reduced purely by changing the scenario. And this led to overall improved glucose and overall improved metrics for the patient with the use of CGM. Finally, a couple of slides on insulin pump, which is CSI during pregnancy. Why uh, insulin infusion? Well, benefits, it, it mimics physiological insulin secretion. Uh, there's no significant difference in, in glycemic control for pregnancy outcomes with CSI versus MDI therapies. And when you look at the data, no major differences yet. Can help address the daytime or nocturnal hypo or a prominent dawn phenomena, which none of your insulins can actually cover. That's what pumps can do. It is a little more complex, requires understanding higher cost and there are always potentials for insulin pump failure, user error and infusion site problems which in pregnancy can be catastrophic. The, problem, the, the, the aspect is that we only talk about hyperglycemia but hypoglycemia is as problematic in, in pregnancy and you will have multiple aspects, risk factors for hypoglycemia, causes of hydrogenic hypoglycemia, there could be severe clinical consequences including anxiety, depression, accidents, seizures and so on even in pregnancy and, and the time and effort and resources required for management. So this is uh, an interesting study. Pregnancy outcome and glycemic control in women with type 1 diabetes. Retrospective comparison between pumps and, and, and MDI. This is Bansi and group study when Hardik was still working in the clinic and not uh, the business tycoon that he is now. Retrospective observational study of 34 type 1 diabetes patients. A1C levels and maternal and fetal outcomes were evaluated in pump treated patients, 14 pump treated versus 20 basal bolus patients. And they looked at A1C levels uh, in, in these two groups from baseline to each trimester and we can see uh, differences in improvement in the patients who are on pump as compared to the MDI. They also looked at comparison of maternal and fetal outcomes between the pump patients and the MDI patients and we are able to see again subtle differences in pay favor of patients on the pump as compared to those who were on multiple daily insulin injections including the incidence of neonatal hypoglycemia, um, the, the, the birth weight and so on. Automated de insulin delivery in women with pregnancy complicated by type 1 diabetes. Uh, this was an article in, in NEJM which, which spoke again about the benefits of uh, automated insulin delivery which is what we have available in India now, the 780G systems. Um, it's still early days, we have reasonable uptake of the 780G automated systems. We have just now uh, uh, looked at starting this in, in one of the pregnancies. Um, I don't have personal experience to share about the 780G in pregnancy yet, but there has been this data uh, which has come for uh, the closed loop which is automated insulin delivery as versus to standard of care. And I think any patient today who is struggling in spite of being on an insulin pump, so of course an insulin pump is better than MDI, but even better than a standard insulin pump is the complete automated insulin delivery. And that's where the, the entire dynamics can change today for those who are struggling because the automated insulin delivery systems 
what we have seen at least in all type 1 patients where we've used it is in a matter of weeks getting patients into the range 80 to 85 percent within a matter of few weeks itself so if you start getting those results in pregnancy so the recommendation for TIR in type 1 pregnancy is to be more than 70 percent between 63 and 140 it's not 90 percent for type 1 it is more than 70 percent but by using 780 G's if you're able to get 80 85 percent you're going to do a super job and great justice for those pregnancies so here again the comparison between closed loop and standard care showing better outcomes again in terms of the LGA or birth weight or hypoglycemia uh, uh, in favor of closed loop systems as compared to standard care in this study where they had almost 60 patients in both the arms so with that let me end the conversation on pumps and, and CGM and happy to take any questions uh, uh, for Shalini is here and I think Dr. Fatak has left so both of us can take questions that the time permits. Thank you so much.